everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be an reading the Enola Holmes series, chapter 7, for you guys. So let's get started. Chapter the 7th. Five weeks later, I was ready. That is to say, in the eyes of Ferndale Hall, I was ready to go to boarding school. And in my own mind, I was ready for a venture of quite a different sort. Regarding boarding school, the seamstress had arrived from London, settled herself in a long vacant room, once accompanied by a lady's maid, sighing over the old throttle sewing machine, and then was taking measurements. Waist 20 inches, tss, too large, chest 21 inches, tisk, far too small, hips 22 inches, tisk, dreadfully inadequate but all could be set right in a fashionable publication of my mother. Would ha never have allowed in Ferndale Hall, the seamstress located the following advertisement. Amplifier. Ideal corset for perfecting thin figures. Words cannot describe its charming effect, which is unapproachable and unattainable by any other corset in the world. Softly padded regulators inside with other improvements combining softness, lightness, and comfort. Regular, regulate at wearer's pleasure any desired fullness with graceful curves, a, be a beautifully proportioned bust, corset scent approval, and plain parcel on receipt or reminisce. Guaranteed. Money returned if not satisfied. Avoid worthless sub substitutions. This device was duly ordered, and the seamstress began to produce prim, dim-colored dresses with high whalebone ribbed collars to strangle me, waistbands designed to choke my breathing, and skirts which ha spread half a dozen flounced cirque petticoats trailed on the floor that I could barely walk. She proposed to sew two dresses with a 19 and a half inch waist, then two with a 19 inch waist and so on to 18 and a half inches and smaller an exception that i grew i would diminish meanwhile increasingly tears telegrams from sherlock holmes was reported no word of mother he had tracked down her old friends her fellow artists her suffrage associates he had even traveled to france to check with her distant re relations the Verness, but to no avail. I had begun to feel afraid for Mum again. Why had the great detective not been able to locate her? Some might, so, might some accident have been fallen her, or even worse, some foul crime. My thinking changed, however, upon the day the seamstress com completed the first dress, at which time I was accepted expected to put on the ideal corset which had arrived as promised in discreet brown paper wrappings with frontal and lateral regu regulators plus of course a patent dress improver so that never again would my back be able to rest that of any chair i sat in also i was expected to wear my hair in a chicken sutured secured with hairpins that dug into my scalp with a fringe of false curls around my forehead similarly similarly screwed skewered as my reward i got to put on my new dress and new shoes just as totterous toddle around in the hall to practice being a young lady that day I realized with irrational yet complete certainty where my mother had gone, some place where there were no hairpins, no corsets, ideal or otherwise, and no patient dress improvers. Meanwhile, my brother Mycroft sent a telegram reporting all, that all was arranged. I had to present myself at such and such a finishing school, house of horrors, and on such and such a date and instructing Lane to see my getting there. More importantly, regarding my own venture, I spent my days as much as I could in a dressing gown, keeping to my room and napping, pleading nervous proportion. Mrs. Lane, who frequently offered me calves foot jelly and 
like the small wonder in Valens, a waste away. Grew so worried that commun that she communicated with Mycroft, who assured her that boarding school, where I would breakfast upon oatmeal and wear wool next to my skin, would restore my health. Nevertheless, she summoned first local apothecary and later Harley Street physician, all the way from London, neither of whom found anything wrong with me. Correctly enough, I was simply avoiding corsets, hairpins, tight shoes, and the like oh, while making up for lost sleep. No one knew that every night after I had heard the rest of the household go to bed, I got my mother's, my curtain rods and made of brass like my mother's bed with knobs on the ends, it served the purpose. And all of this had to be done before the lanes drew, rose at dawn Although my nights were far more active and satisfactory than my days, I did not ever find what I desired. Any note of farewell, affectionate regard, or explanation from Mum. But truly, at this point, not much explanation was needed. I knew she had practiced her deceptions for my sake, at least in part, and I knew that the money she had so cleverly sl slipped to me was meant to give me freedom. Thanks to Mum, therefore, it was a surprisingly hopeful, if nervous, state of mind that one sunny morning in late August, August I mounted to the seat of the con conveyance that was to take me away from the only home I had ever known. Lane had arranged with the local farmer for, for the loan of a horse and a kind of hybrid contraption or trap, a luggage wagon with an upholstered seat for me and the driver. I was to travel to the railway station in comfort, if not in style. I hope it doesn't rain, Mrs. Lane remarked, standing off, standing in the drive to see me off. It hadn't rained in weeks, not since the day I had gone searching for my mother, unlikely, said Lane, giving me his hand so I could step upon, up to my seat like a lady. One kid loved hand while his hand in his while the other lifted my white ruffled parcel not there's not a cloud in the sky smiling down on lane and mrs lane i settled first my bustle then myself next to dick my driver just as my bustle occupied back in the seat occupied the back of the seat mrs lane had arranged my hair to occupy the back of my head as was the fashion so that my hat, rather a bourbon strand dinner plate, tilted forward over my eyes. I wore a tape suit that I had chosen carefully for its nondescript, indeed ugly color, its 19 and a half inch waistband, full skirt, and concealing jacket. Beneath the jacket, I had left the skirt's waistband unbuttoned so that I could corset myself as lightly as possible and almost comfortably I could breathe, as would be needed very soon. You look every inch like a lady, Miss Anola, said Lane, standing back. You'll be a credit to Ferndall Hall, I'm sure. Little did he know. We'll miss you, quavered Mrs. Lane. For a moment my heart reproached me. I saw tears on her soft old face. Thank you, I said rather stiffly, starching myself against my moan emotion. Dick, drive on. All the way to the gate, I stared at the horse's ears. My brother Mycroft had hired men to clean up the lawn of the estate, and I did not want to see with my wild rose bushes cut down. Goodbye, Miss Enola, and good luck said the lodge keeper as he opened the gates for us. Thank you, Cooper. As the horse trotted through Kineford, I sighed allow and allowed my glance to roam, taking a farewell look at the butcher's shop, the green grocer's shop, black beamed, whitewashed, hatchet cottaged, public house, post, and telegraph office, constabulary, more Tudor cottages, with tiny windows scowling under their heavy straw forelocks. The inn, the smithy vicarage, the granite chapel, 
with its mossy slate roof. Headstones tilting this way and that in the graveyard. I let us trot almost past before I suddenly, as if I had just that moment thought of it, Dick, stop. I wish to say goodbye to my father. He pulled the horse to a halt. What was that, Miss Enola? When dealing with Dick, full and simple explanations were necessary. I wished to visit my father's grave. I told him one patient word at a time and say a prayer for him in the chapel. Poor father, he would not have desired such prayers. As a logician and unbeliever, Mum had once told me he had not desired a funeral. His request for cre had been for cremation, but after his demise, his wishes had been overruled for the fear that kind Ford might never recover from the scandal. In his slow, worried Dick, Worried way, Dick said, I am to drive you to the railway station, miss. There is plenty, plenty of time. You can have a pint at the public house while you're waiting for me. Oh, I. He turned the horse back, trod, and jumped, drew up at the door of the chapel. We sat for a moment as before he remembered his manners, but then secured the reins, got down, and came around to my side to help me descend. Thank you, I told him. As I withdrew my gloved hand from his grubby fist. Come back for me in ten minutes. Nonsense. I knew he'd be half an hour or more in the public house. Yes, miss. He touched his cap. He drove away and armored swirl of skirts. I minced into the chapel as I had expected and hoped. I had found it unoccupied. After scanning the empty pews, I grinned, tossed my parcel into the Cast off clothing for the poor box. Hoisted my skirts above my knees and dashed for the back door. And out into the sunlit graveyard. Down a twisting path. Worn between the tottering headstones I ran. Keeping the chapel between me and any witnesses who might be passing upon the village street. When I reached the hedge at the bottom of the chapel grounds, I let more and climbed this stile, turned right, ran a bit farther, and yes, indeed, yes, there waited my bicycle, hidden in the hedge where I had left it yesterday, or rather, yesternight, in the small hours by the light of the nearly full moon, on the bicycle were mounted two containers, a basket in the front, and a box in the back, both packed full of both packed full of sandwiches, pickles, hard-boiled eggs, water flask, bandaging in case of accident, a tire repair kit, knickerbockers, and my comfortable old black boots, toothbrush, toothbrush, and such. On my person also were mounted two containers hidden beneath my toupee suit, one in the front and one in the back. The one in the front was quite a unique bust enhancer that I had secretly sewn for myself out of materials purloined from Mum's wardrobe. For the container in back, I had devised a dressed improver-like sort. While leaving home, my mother had worn a bustle, yet left its horse hair stuffing behind. The answer seemed obvious to me. In order to conceal the dress improver's place, the baggage necessary for running away, and I... Being blessed with a flat chest had carried her example a step further. My various and proper regulators, enhancers, and improvers remained in Ferndale Hall, stuffed up my chimney, chimney, actually. In their places upon my person, I wore cloth containers, baggage in effect, filled with unmentionables, wrapped around bundles of blank notes, and addition I had folded carefully, chosen my spare dress, and secured it to the back between my petticoats, where it, perfect, where it perfectly filled my train. In the pockets of my suit, I had a handkerchief, a cake of soap comb, a hairbrush, and my now precious booklet of ciphers, smelling salts, energy-sustaining candies, indeed. I bore a steamer's trunk worth of essentials, hopping onto my bicycle, letting my petticoats and skirts modestly drape my ankles and pedaled off across country. A good cyclist does not need a road. I would follow the farmlands and pasturelands for the time being. The ground was backed hard as iron. 
I would leave no tracks. By tomorrow, I imagine my brother, the great detective Sherlock Holmes, would be attempting to locate a missing sister as well as a missing mother. He would expect me to flee from him, therefore I would not. I would flee toward him. He lived in London, so did Mycroft. On the account, and also because it's the word world's largest and most dangerous city. It was the last place on earth either of them would expect me to venture. Therefore, I would go there. They would expect me to disguise myself as a boy. Very likely they had heard about my knickerbockers and anyway in Shakespeare and other works of fiction. Runaway girls always disguise themselves as boys. Therefore, I would not. I would disguise myself as the last thing my brothers would think I could. Having met me as a plain beanpole of a child, in a frock that barely covered my knees, I would disguise myself as a gown, as a grown woman, and I would set about finding my mother. End of chapter 7